So hi everyone, my name is Kevin Larson. Uh, I am with a team at Microsoft called the Advanced Reading Technologies Team. Uh, and the goal of our team is to figure out how to make on-screen reading easier and more pleasant. Uh, and we're a bit of an unusual team, that our team is made up of really three different disciplines. Computer scientists who uh, handle all the engineering. Uh, I'm the reading psychologist on the team, so I study how people read and figure out what we can do to uh, best match how people read. And then the third group is typographers, who are a completely separate group who study how people read. Um, but they come at it from a different perspective. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what they do. And to do that, I'm going to have everyone take a quiz here with me. So up on screen, uh, we've got two letters, an I and an O. Uh, and there's two different versions of it. Uh, and the O's in these two different versions are a little bit different. The I's uh, are exactly the same, but one O is larger than the other. Uh, what I want everyone to do is look at it and try to tell me which O is the same size as the I next to it. All right, so who thinks the O on the left is the same size as the I on the right, as the I? Okay, and who thinks the O on the right is the same size as the I? Okay, excellent. So we had about 90% who said that the O on the right was the same size and 10% who said the O on the left was the same size. So here is the answer. <laughs> Mathematically, the O on the left is exactly the same height as the I. But if O's were designed like that and you had a whole page of them, they would all look too small. They would appear to be not quite the same size as the I. So instead, what typographers actually do are make O's that are like the one on the right, which are not mathematically the same size. Instead, they have what are called undershoots and overshoots that go beyond the line of the I. Uh, and by doing that, it makes the O appear to be the same size, even though, as you can see, mathematically, it's not actually the same size. Uh, and so this is something that typographers have been doing for, for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, in order to conform to how people read. Uh, and so the modern psychological explanation for this is the Mueller liar illusion. And has anybody seen this before? So up on screen we've got two lines that are, uh, the two lines are exactly the same length, but if you put a corner on them that points out, the line will appear to be a little bit larger. If you put a corner on it that points in, the line will appear to be a little bit smaller. Uh, and so this is a lot like the I and the O, that the I is pointed in and the O is pointed more out, so you've got to adjust them in order to uh, make the lines look the same size. So here is another visual illusion that you might see in your letters that you're not uh, recognizing. Uh, so up on screen we have the Georgia letter X. And most people would assume that you make an X by drawing two lines and having them cross perfectly. Uh, but what actually is appearing in this X is the bar at the upper right of the X. I'm going to move from my spot. The bar at the upper right of the X is shifted a little bit down. And you need to shift it a little bit down to make it appear to be lined up. That if they actually lined up, it wouldn't appear right. So the the visual illusion that people might be familiar with on the left is the Pogendorf illusion. Uh, in, this, in this illusion, uh, the lines A and C, do the lines A and C appear to be lined up? Yes. Most people will see that when uh, mathematically the lines B and C actually line up. Uh, so you offset the C a little bit down in order to make it appear a line of the A. And so we do this in our typographers do this when they design letters like X's uh, in order to make it appear like there are two lines that are crossing. Here is uh, another trick that typographers do uh, in order to make letters uh, appear more reasonable. Um, so up on screen, we have, we have three different fonts that we're showing uh, the word fine in. And on the left, you have a F and an I in each of those, where it's just the letter F and the letter I, uh, as it would appear if you had to type that letter uh, in isolation. Uh, and in all of these, the top of the F comes a little too close to the dot of the I and looks uncomfortable, right? Yes? Good. Uh, <coughs> Not good, but that's what happens. Uh, so what typographers do to make that not 
be noticeable is they'll design special glyphs called ligatures where they combine the F and the I into one character. And so they take that top of the F and make that appear to be the dot of the I. Uh, and by doing that, you get a more pleasing uh, word, F-I, uh, fine in this case, out of it. And here is another example of uh, things typographers do to improve the reading experience. Uh, in the top version, so we've got the word Tacoma, Washington here. Uh, and in the top version, we have uh, each of the letters spaced as they naturally would with their default spacing. Uh, and by doing this, we end up with a couple unusual gaps. One is between the T and the A of the Tacoma, and the other is between the W and the A of Washington. That those are, just because of the shape of the letters, slightly too large gaps. So what typographers will do is shift these unusual combinations either closer apart or further together depending on the combination. But the T and the A in the bottom one has been shifted in a little closer and the W and the A on the bottom one have been shifted together. And by doing this, you get uh, something that, that looks better and you won't have problems like uh, a split in the word and the word appearing to be two different words uh, when all the letter spaces are, are equal like that. All right, so I'm going to switch topics here, and we're going to talk very briefly about legibility. Uh, we do a lot of work on legibility in our team, trying to figure out how do we make every word and every font as easy to read uh, on screen as we can. Uh, and this would be a great topic to ask questions about, but I'm going to cover it very briefly here. Uh, just to cover the one question that I always get about which is better to read, serifs or sans serifs. Uh, and so... Actually, I'll assume that not everybody knows what a serif font is, uh, and I will show you on this form. Um, so this is uh, a serifed font, and the serifs are these little feet that you can see at the top of the W and at the bottom of the M, uh, or uh, at the tip of the T coming down. And so what we have here are two different letter S's. Uh, the left on the S is centaur, which is a serif font, and you can see the ends of it uh, having additional markings to it that's a little bit larger and pronounced at the end. Uh, on the right, we have the font Helvetica, which is a sans serif font. It doesn't have those feet in that font. Um, so who knows which is easier to read, serif or sans serif fonts? Serif fonts. Does everyone agree? Is serif fonts more easy, easy to read? One. You heard that, so we got one comment that it's different if it's on screen or in type. Great. Okay, so most people, particularly if you ask a typography community, uh, which are easier to read, serif or sans serif fonts, you will find very strong opinions, but they will be evenly split. That half of people will tell you serif fonts are definitely easier to read in all situations, and the other half will say serif font, sans serif fonts are definitely easier to read. Uh, and you hear a lot of opinions about this, but we didn't have a whole lot of data. So uh, what we've done is collected a lot of data about how easy it is to recognize individual letters. And we would do this with uh, a test called a distance threshold test. Uh, and this is kind of like if you go to an, uh, an eye doctor uh, and they want to measure your visual acuity, they'll show you that chart that starts off with the big E at the top. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? And then you read smaller and smaller until you get to the line of text that you can't read. They'll do that and say, okay, this is your visual acuity based on how far down you can get on that chart. So what if we were to take that chart and switch it to a different font? Would you then be able to read to a smaller line of type? So that's really what we're doing here. Uh, and so we've done this with a bunch of different fonts to find out which letters and which fonts uh, are easiest to read. So. Up on screen, we've got Centaur on the left and Helvetica on the right, and you can see the big form, and everyone can read those are S's. Uh, and then we've got the smaller forms. And so for somebody in, well, in the back of the room, we're looking at it on another screen. Uh, so somebody further away where you can just make out one S but not the other, uh, is the Centaur S on the left easier to read or Helvetica on the right? Raise your hand if you think it's Centaur. Okay. Raise your hand if you, think if you think it's Helvetica. All right, so we had many abstentions, but I would say uh, uh, about three times as many people raised their hand for Centaur as for Helvetica. 
Uh, and that turns out to be correct, that when we uh, take this and show it to a lot of people, we find that people are able to read smaller forms of the letter S in Centaur than in Helvetica. Uh, and so what we're looking at are the, the raw data for 12 different fonts. Now what I want you to take away from this slide is that when we look at this data, we find that Centaur, which is a serif font, was our best performer. Futura, which is a SAM serif, was our second best performer. Baskerville, which is a serif, is our next best. Verdana, which is a SAM serif. So it turns out the legibility of fonts is not strictly determined by whether or not they have serifs or not. There are uh, many more interesting details in, in letter design that we care about. So there can be legible serifs and there can be legible SAM serifs. So I don't have an answer for you on which it's more legible because that doesn't seem to be the main distinction. But please ask about legibility during Q&A because there's lots of cool stuff here. All right, but here is one of the big things we're going to talk about today, uh, and that is why would we choose to use one particular font uh, at any given time, given that, that we know legibility isn't the only distinction, that it's not serif or sans serif, but we use fonts to uh, convey lots of things. So uh, I'm going to ask you guys if the image that I'm currently showing on screen is comfortable to look at and why. Is this comfortable to look at? Yes? All right, you're supposed to say no, this looks weird. <coughs> this woman is very happy, but she's saying this is the worst day of my life. This should feel uncomfortable to look at because you're thinking, how can this be the worst day of her life when she looks so happy? There must be something that really went wrong. She's being held hostage and is being told, you must look happy or we're going to do something bad to you. Something seems wrong here. Uh, where if you look at this version, she's clearly unhappy and that's not good to look at, but it makes sense. This is the worst day of her life and it really kind of shows in the face that she's making. So this is what I would call congruency versus incongruency. This is a congruent saying that goes with the image that she's making where the previous one was incongruent. Uh, now I think we have the same kind of congruencies in text and so we are going to do some live demonstrations here to show that off. Um, has anyone heard of the Stroop effect before? Nobody? A few people. Okay. So in the Stroop test what we're going to do is name the color of the ink that we're seeing. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is give everybody, I'm going to give a three, two, one countdown and then we're going to name off these five colors as fast as we can. So everybody ready? Okay. Three, two, one, go. Yellow, blue, red, green, purple. Excellent. Okay. All right. So now we're going to do it again. I'm going to put up now words this time uh, that are going to appear on screen. Just ignore those words entirely. Your task is just to name the color of the ink. We don't care what the words are. Are you guys ready? Three, two, one, go. Yellow, blue, purple, purple, green. All right, so that one was harder, right? No, you found it just as easy? Okay, some other people found it hard. So this is an, an incongruent text, that the color that you're looking at is different from the word that is there. And we're able to attend to both of those pieces of information at the same time, both the actual color and the word that it's there. When they match, if I showed you the words in their exact color, you'd have no problem with it. But when they don't match, like they don't match here, that causes difficulty. So that's with color but we can also do it with other dimensions of text. All right. Good. Okay, so this time we're going to deal with the dimension of weight in text. And so up on screen I've got a bunch of different animals and half of these animals are what we call light animals and half of them are heavy animals. So is a pig a heavy or a light animal? <coughs> heavy. Is a mouse a heavy or light animal? Yeah. Light. Rabbit. Walrus, elephant, rat, hedgehog, rhino. Excellent. Okay. So here's what we're going to do now. It's going to be the exact same test. I'm going to show you more animals and I'm going to put up a list on the left and I want everyone to shout out as quickly as you can, heavy, heavy, light, light, or whatever the, whatever the weight of the animals are. Okay? Is everyone ready? 
Here at the count of three, we're going to do it. One, two, three. Heavy, light, 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 heavy. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to do one more, and it's going to be on the right this time. Is everyone ready? Three, two, one, go. Heavy, light, light, heavy. All right, which one was easier to do, the one on the left or the one on the right? Left. Left was easier to do because it was congruent. You can see, I didn't tell you anything about the font there, but one of those fonts is a light font and the other font is a heavy font. Does everyone agree with that? Yeah, okay. And so what, uh, this was a study done by Lewis and Walker, and what they found is when they had the light and heavy animals in their congruent condition on the left, people were able to identify the weight of the animal faster than when we did it on the right where they were incongruent. All right, so those are two dimensions that are uh, pretty straightforward. They relate to the physicality of the font. Uh, now I'm going to move on to other dimensions of the font that, that aren't quite so straightforward. So up on screen, we've got two different fonts. And I'm going to claim something strange. I'm going to claim that one of these fonts is masculine and the other font is feminine. We already had so much shout out the answer, but who thinks that the first font, the top font, is masculine? Nobody. Who thinks that the top font is feminine? Most everybody. A few abstentions. But does that seem strange to anyone that we all actually agreed on whether or not whether or not a font was feminine or masculine? No? Everyone's good with that? Okay. So <laughs> would you be surprised if I were to tell you that if you were to name words like jump rope and mother in the feminine font, you would read them faster than in the masculine font? And if I gave you words like Jeep and football, you would name them faster in the masculine font than in the feminine font? Nope. So that's what we've done, and that's exactly what happens. So people are able to attend to multiple dimensions of words at the same time, both the meaning of the word as well as features of the font that are either directly physical like color and weight uh, or something a little more ephemeral like masculine and feminine. We're able to pay attention to both of these at the same time. Uh, and the reason we care about this is uh, for something that typographers have been doing for literally hundreds of years. When something is designed well, a book or a magazine, what happens is a typographer will read that book or magazine and figure out what's the personality here. And then they will apply a font to it that matches the personality. Uh, so this kind of, this matching doesn't happen by accident. People will do it intentionally and uh, that's one of the things that you'll find in good design versus bad design, that you'll have this congruency between content and font. All right, so that's, that was one of the big points of the talk. Here, I'm going to do one more section, and then, uh, and then we're going to move on to Q&A today. Uh, so the last section is going to be about uh, why we care about good page design uh, as opposed to choosing the right font. So up on screen, I've got two different page designs, one that I would call good and one that I would call bad. Uh, who thinks the one on the left is the good one? Nobody. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> You've passed this test. The one on the right is what we would call a good design. The one on the left is the bad design. Uh, the one on the left is so bad, in fact, that you've got to jump over that image to keep reading. Uh, and so when we ask people which do you like better, everyone says they like the one on the right better. But we wanted to know if this has an effect on reading performance. So we had people read these two kinds of documents and measured their reading speed and comprehension, uh, and we found absolutely no difference. People were able to read and comprehend both of these at exactly the same rate. Uh, we were a little disappointed in this. So <laughs> we tried again. So this time, instead of the page design, we went to these typographic features that typographers have been designing for hundreds of years, things like uh, the ligatures that we talked about earlier and the kerning that we, talk <coughs> kerning that we talked about earlier, as well as old-style numerals and small caps, which are things you'll find in every high-end book or magazine, uh, but sometimes don't find on computers today. Uh, so we wanted to know, can people read these kinds of documents faster when we put in all of these features that typographers would consider essential? 
Uh, and what we found is no. Reading speed and comprehension was exactly the same in both of these. Uh, and slightly worse is when we asked people which they preferred, it was split 50-50. Essentially, people couldn't tell that we were putting in these features that we considered essential. Uh, so this didn't make us happy either. <laughs> so we took a different tactic. We went into the literature and we found this interesting finding that said that if you induce people into a good mood, uh, and you can induce people into a good mood by giving them a small gift like a candy bar or having them watch a humorous video, uh, if you induce people into a good mood, they'll perform better on certain kinds of creative cognitive tasks. Uh, and one of those tasks is the candle task. Has anyone heard of the candle task before? Nope. Excellent. So <laughs> in the candle task, what happens is you've got a cork board affixed to the wall. Imagine there's a cork board here. Uh, and you're given a candle, a match, and a box full of tacks. And you're told to affix the candle to the cork board in such a way that when you light the candle, it's not going to drip wax all over the floor. You have an answer for me? It's not possible. It's not possible. Okay. So <coughs> <laughs> that's not the answer you're supposed to come up with. So the answer that most people come up when they try to solve this is what we're showing here. And this was actually, so my boss who is in the audience tonight uh, spent a year where he was drawing these trays where he'd make a tray uh, around the candle that could capture the wax. And he spent a year of lunch times drawing these trays, trying to figure out a way to architect this perfect tray that was going to capture all the wax. And this is everybody's first idea when they try to solve this, is they try to build a tray that's going to hold the wax and then use a couple of the tacks to affix it into the cork board somehow. Um, this will not work. The wax is always going to drip through this tray uh, and Greg is disappointed that he could not build this perfect tray. So that's the wrong answer. But people who are induced into a good mood are more likely to find the correct answer. Does anybody know what the correct answer is? Take the cork board off the wall. Take the cork board off the wall. <laughs> that would work, but no, it's really affixed in there good. We use big four-inch screws, and you were not given a screwdriver. <laughs> Did I say the candle had to be lit? I did not say that, and that is one of the legal solutions people have come <laughs> up with. Uh, cutting the, the wick out is another legal solution that, that is disallowed. The, so the answer that we're looking for is for to take this box that's full of tacks and dump the tacks out and use the box as a candle holder. That You pin the box to the cork board, 